Flame of Raka is a fighting game based on the anime of the same name. It follows a teenage boy named Raka as he hopes to fulfill his dream of becoming a ninja, and although the game doesn't follow the source material to the T, there are several elements that fans of the show will instantly recognize. One of them being the generous amount of characters that you get to use throughout the game. As with most fighters, they all possess a range of basic moves as well as character-specific arts that makes trying out each one essential to find one that suits your style of play best. Apart from having a HP bar, you'll also have a power bar, which dictates your ability to perform these special attacks. It increases when the character deals damage and decreases when the character performs a special move. This setup incentivizes always being on the attack. That results in some explosive battles as you progress through the game. Now what makes Flame of Raka slightly different from other fighters on the Game Boy Advance is the way in which each stage you fight on in the game is made up of several levels. This adds a serious degree of strategy to each fight, as every elevation in the level can be used to your advantage when it comes to both attacking as well as defending. On the visual front, Flame of Wrecker is really impressive on the GBA. From the solid frame rate to the range of sprites and backgrounds, it looks great up and running on the handheld, especially with the various effects and extra touches that adorn each character as each fight plays out. On the whole, Flame of Wrecker is a solid fighting game on the GBA. There are some shortcomings for sure, like a lack of extra modes and not much replay value to be had once you've gone through it, but if you've exhausted the usual fighting suspects on the handheld like Street Fighter Alpha 3, then Flame of Wrecker is well worth picking up and checking out. A Sound of Thunder is based on a movie that released a couple of years before it sees the player taken on the role of Travis, a biologist who works for a company that have managed to create a portal back into the past and reach the time of the dinosaurs. Now I know the premise sounds insane, but the gameplay more than makes up for it, by handing you a series of weapons and letting you go to town on the now dinosaur infested world. The game is a sort of precursor to the team's excellent work on the Max Payne game on the Game Boy Advance. A lot of the ideas in the game started here, and it's no more apparent than with the use of an isometric perspective. It's really similar to the Tony Hawk games on the handheld, which utilized real-time 3D character sprites, allowing for some rather smooth and impressive animations for each character on screen. Of course, there were some corners that had to be cut in order to make the shooting mechanics viable, and what the developers came up with was a lock-on system, so players could actually target with some sort of accuracy in this isometric viewpoint. Unfortunately, due to this mechanic, the gameplay can feel a bit automatic, but actually there's more to the game than just mindlessly shooting through wave after wave of enemies. A huge emphasis is put on environmental puzzles, that break up the gameplay quite nicely, and thankfully they're neither too easy or insanely hard. You'll find yourself having to shuffle around crates, flicking switches, and opening doors that all provide a meaningful challenge to complete. The Sound of Thunder doesn't stop there though, and goes even further by offering up driving sections, which sees various dinosaurs chasing you down whilst you try to shoot your way to victory. These racing levels are a great inclusion and actually help add a bit of variety to the action. Overall, The Sound of Thunder is by no means one of the best games on the console, but it's definitely one that's worth checking out if you're into action shooters on the go. Double Dragon was one of my favorite beat-em-ups whilst growing up, at first being introduced to it on the NES and then moving on to the sequels a few years later on the Super Nintendo. As you can imagine, upon hearing the news that it would be hitting the Game Boy Advance, I couldn't wait to get my hands on it. Thankfully, it didn't disappoint and provided one of the best games in the series. It's essentially a retelling of the original conflict between the Lee Brothers and the Shadow Warriors with the best elements from every game in the series. The result is the ultimate game of Double Dragon, bare knuckle action against waves of bad guys and bosses in a series of ever more difficult stages. If you're a fan of the beat em up genre, you'll have hours of fun pummeling the gang members into the pavement with the wide array of moves and weapons the dragons have at their disposal. The game has a fair 8 stages which you'll most likely be able to play through in one sitting. The gameplay engine is still nice and simple, as it's basically one punch and one kick when it comes to basic attacks. But what makes the gameplay more compelling is the amount of moves that can be pulled off by combining several inputs together. It's a fairly large list of attacks which really helps each encounter shine, as you get to build your approach and find out which moves work best for your style. Double Dragon Advance managed to improve the graphical output of the series while staying true to its original style. 
the animation was top of the line with probably the most stable frame rate the series ever saw. It was a long overdue and well executed homage to one of gaming's greats. If you ever played any version of the series and have good memories of it, this game is an essential purchase. So if you're looking to jump into a beat em up on the Game Boy Advance, make sure to not pass this one up. When it comes to hidden gems on the Game Boy Advance, it doesn't get any more hidden than Invader. This is, without a doubt, one of the best shooters on the handheld that hardly anyone has heard of. The fact that it was only available in Europe is something that probably contributed to its relative obscurity, as well as only a small number of copies being printed, contributing even more to this game's lack of popularity. Your mission is to defend the solar system against a seemingly unstoppable alien force bent on total domination. Now the best way to describe the gameplay is hardcore. Invader is a shooter that's not afraid to challenge those that play it. As you would expect, there's a bunch of levels that make up the game that slowly turn up the heat. You've got many options when it comes to fighting back though, the most prominent being your standard lasers that can't quite get the job done on their own. And this is where the upgrade aspect comes into play. After taking down enemies, they will drop their weapons, with about 5 different types being available. Knowing which type will drop from which enemy is essential to making your way through each level, and saving the right weapon for the right time soon becomes the order of the day. Now considering the Game Boy Advance's limited power, Invader takes full advantage of everything the console has to offer, and manages to create a rather impressive experience for the player. The backgrounds are different for each stage and constantly change whilst flying. All ships produce a shadow that gives the game better depth, despite it being a 2D shooter. And many of the enemies aren't even sprites, but 3D objects as well. It all runs at a buttery smooth pace, and doesn't skip a beat once the on-screen action starts to ramp up. If you're a fan of the genre, then Invader would make for a great choice when looking for a new shooter to jump into. But if you're only a passing fan, it's still worth picking up, just get ready for one hell of a challenge. The Game Boy Advance was home to a wide range of action shooters, but with the likes of Metal Slug and Contra on the handheld as well, there was a big chance that many other games would get lost in the mix. Medal of Honor Infiltration was one of these games, and it's a huge shame as it never got the recognition it deserved, as it's one of the best games I've ever had the pleasure of playing on the handheld. The gameplay is largely split up into two separate styles of play with the most prominent being that of a top-down shooter that has you complete various objectives throughout a series of linear missions. The other is a first-person rail shooter that gives you a powerful machine gun and plenty of targets to take down. Now there's about 15 levels in total, with the two types of play being evenly split amongst them. In the top-down portions, your character carries one gun and one explosive weapon at a time, with four being available on hull. Each weapon has a distinct use, so choosing the correct weapon set for the level is very important. By playing through the single player campaign, you slowly unlock more modes that allows you to jump into any one of the missions you may have completed up until that point, as well as a survival mode in which you take on a never-ending stream of enemies until you die and have your stats recorded. These options provide a means to play the game once you've completed it, allowing the player to hone their skills without having to worry about failing. Medal of Honor Infiltrator is so fun, challenging and well made, but the only complaint I have about the game is that the single player mode is just a bit too short. It would have been nice to have seen it further fleshed out with more missions to go through, but when it comes to looking for something that's quick to pick up and play in short bursts on the Game Boy Advance, Medal of Honor Infiltrator is the perfect choice. Now, there's no denying that on first glance all signs point to Go Go Beckham being absolutely awful. For starters, it's essentially a branded title based on the popular English footballer. This alone is enough to get the alarm bells ringing, but Go Go Beckham is a surprisingly good platformer that brings with it a pretty unique premise that opens a wide range of gameplay opportunities. The entire game revolves around the use of a football that Beckham constantly keeps with him. You'll be dribbling, running, jumping, and using the ball to collect coins and defeat enemies. Each of them usually require a few hits with one focusing on a weak point, and then the other taking them out completely. But keeping control of the ball itself is no easy task, and this is where half of the fun lies. 
Of course, the ball kicking approach to taking out enemies and collecting items isn't exactly new. You've no doubt seen it used in games like Rayman, for example. But the implementation here is excellent, and it would be harsh to criticize Denki for being unoriginal. They were, after all, asked to create a game featuring David Beckham for the Game Boy Advance, and they most definitely did, but didn't sell for the usual lack of thought and care seen in most licensed games. Gogo Beckham is made up of about 40 levels, which is set across 5 separate zones, and throughout the course of the game, the more you use Beckham's abilities, the more capable they will become over time. That's not all, however, as you can also pick up spells, which translate to enhanced ball skills. These range from special shots to faster dribbling, as well as Beckham's trademark bending ability, which all manage to come in handy throughout the game's runtime. My favorite part of the game has to be its presentation, but the levels themselves take in center state. Each of them offer up their own distinct graphical flavor, with the level design being consistently engaging, and more than a little reminiscent of some of the best 16-bit platformers of all, like Super Mario World. Overall, if you're looking for a great platformer to lose some hours to, then Coco Beckham is more than up to the task. There's no shortage of quality puzzle games on the Game Boy Advance, but one that never got his chance to shine has to be Denki Blocks. Sure, the plot is pretty thin even by video game standards, but underneath all of the innocence and cheerful characters, it is a serious game that takes no prisons. While all of these characters look as if they've been torn straight out of a kid's cartoon, they are ready and willing to drive you mad with complex puzzles. Once you've established yourself as part of the Denki Blocks competition, each of the characters will present you with a set of puzzles for you to solve. These puzzles involve moving specifically colored blocks around obstacles and grouping them together. All you have to do is get the colored blocks together in a timely manner and move on to the next puzzle. Once you've completed 15 of a given set of puzzles, you can move on to the next opponent's set and begin the process all over again. If you manage to beat everyone, you will become the Denki Block Champ. The concept sounds so simple. What's so hard about moving a couple of blocks around? Well, it's the actual grouping of blocks that makes everything so much more complicated. You're given free range over the given puzzle, letting you move the blocks in whichever direction you please. But if you rush too much at grouping the blocks together, you might accidentally trap a single block in a corner, leaving it stuck with no chance of reuniting it with the other blocks. It's all a matter of carefully planning your moves and acting accordingly. Just one tiny mistake has the potential to completely ruin your chances of clearing a specific level. If you're a fan of the more frantic and fast-paced puzzle games, then Denki Blocks may not appeal to you. It's all about putting your problem-solving skills to the test. It is certainly an aggravating experience, but that same aggravation can also be highly rewarding for those that stick with it. If you see it on the cheap, don't hesitate to add this one to your collection. No doubt the first game that comes to mind for many when talking about kart races on the Game Boy Advance is Mario Kart, and for good reason, as it's easily one of the best games on the system. Before Nintendo unleashed it onto the handheld, Konami threw their horse into the race and conjured up a clone, albeit with a few differences that helped differentiate itself from its clear inspiration. Of course, the first notable aspect of the game are the characters themselves that come from the vast history of Konami's back catalogue. From the likes of Goldman to Metal Gear Solid, there's bound to be more than a few that you'll want to race as. Now as with most racing games, the progression throughout the experience is presented by several cups you have to win in order to advance. Each of them are comprised of several tracks with about 16 in total, with all of them offering up unique environments that are also based around several Konami properties, as well as challenging obstacles to stop you dead in your path. And to make things even more interesting is of course an item system that grants you several power-ups such as missiles or invincibility to help even the odds against your rivals. One of the best aspects of the game is no doubt the visuals. First off, it runs at a steady pace and doesn't buckle when the action heats up, which is absolutely essential for a racing game. It utilizes the system hardware and its Mode 7 style 3D effects for the track layout, which will go on to be used in many of the great Game Boy Advance racing games that released. When it comes to replayability, this is where Konami Racers truly comes into its own. There's a bunch of extra modes apart from the usual championship that allows the player to take part in events like Bomb Tag. There's several of these battle type events that can be enjoyed with up to 4 players if you're lucky enough to know someone with the game. On the whole, if you're fond of racing games, then don't hesitate to pick this one up. 
The Game Boy Advance was well known for its abundance of solid platforms, with the likes of Mario taking center stage to more obscure offerings like Astro Ball. One hidden gem that never gets the recognition it deserves, however, is Wario Land 4. As with most Nintendo platformers, the game is easy to master but incredibly hard to pipe down. It plays perfectly and every move can be easily executed. There's absolutely nothing wrong in the controls department nor in the structure of the levels. Everything has been perfectly built. Your aim is pretty simple. Collect four pieces of a jewel, find a switch, press it and go back to the level entrance before time expires. The countdown only starts after you've pressed the switch so you have plenty of time to explore each level. And believe me, there's a lot to be discovered. Many walls and floors can be broken, opening the way to tons of treasures and you can perform a wider range of moves to find secret passages and get rid of enemies along the way. What stands out the most is the inclusion of several boss fights that will test even the most confident of players. They were all intricately designed, making them a real standout amongst the many enemies you'll encounter throughout the adventure. But one of the best aspects of the game is that it offers up a set of difficulty settings to make your way through. They're significantly different to each other. For example, key items are found in different places. Moreover, if you complete both modes, you'll open up Super Hard Mode, which is the ultimate challenge. This adds immensely to the replay value of the game and allows players to jump straight back in and experience the adventure in a different way. With its beautiful visuals and varied levels, catchy music and huge amount of challenge, Wario Land 4 is one of the best platformers you'll find on the Game Boy Advance. Ugly Union is an SRPG which does a great deal to stand out against the other heavy hitters in the genre on the GBA. The game still presents the player with an overhead map, much like the Fire Emblem games, but upon entering battle, the action switches to a side-scrolling view as the results of each skirmish unfold. Now one huge aspect of the game is the acquisition of cards that determine your proficiency in combat. Each card is chosen at the beginning of each turn and is usable by certain characters or roles. It provides the baseline damage you can do in battle, and each card levels up with use, eventually becoming an essential part of your growing strategies throughout the game. Now battles are controlled affairs in a basic sense. You choose whether your units attack aggressively, utilizing your power up bar, or more passively increasing it. Filling your bar allows units to use card-based powers in battle. Often these have great results, but getting to know each card's effectiveness takes a while. This minimal control might seem like window dressing, but when battles are stacked one after the other, the decisions you make on how you manage your power gauge become increasingly important. Visually, Ugdra Union sports some of the best sprite work on the handheld. The sheer variety of units and the animations that come along with them are nothing short of incredible. It really showcases what the Game Boy Advance was capable of when it came to sprite-based gameplay. All in all, Ugly Union is one of those games you don't want to miss, even if you aren't generally a strategy fan. While that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for part 2 as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos, which release every Monday and Thursday. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, Rhino, Skill Jim, Shuden, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, Dio, Omar, Strider, Pierre, Carl, Awesome Jacket Dude, Ryan, Alex, Curse Salaryman, GameCube Galaxy, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links in the description. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. I'll catch you next time.